Hey, thrilling suspense fanatics, this tale is a subtle one, full of double meanings and double-edged swords. Look out for hints and ways that things can be interpreted where opposites can exist at the same time, in contradiction but balance with one another. I think Pat McIntosh has done quite well here. So with that said, let's get into it. Falcon's Mate by Pat McIntosh Poor Thula, said Anika from her big leather-curtained horse litter. Is your headache any better? That, oddly enough, decided me. My headache was definitely her fault. I made some answer and reined in my horse to let the big litter lurch through the archway into the inn-yard, nodding to her cousin where he sat his raw-boned bay horse bawling instructions at the pack-drivers. He ignored me. "'Don't you go up,' I said to Anika. "'I'll stable my horse.' "'Gellin says they serve in half an hour,' she said, jumping down in a swirl of embroidered petticoats. I nodded and led my big gray Dester into the stable, unsaddling and brushing him down with soothing, accustomed movements. I considered the matter. If she had drugged my wine, it was with a purpose. I could think of two, but dismissed one. I had lived among girls of my own age or younger since I was seven. If she had done it out of sheer mischief, Anika, of all girls, would have shown it, by secret smiles and giggles, and yet the other was incredible. Three nights running, the door had been locked, the key under my pillow, the open window at least four fathoms above ground with nothing to tie a rope to. Master Gellin took these precautions, not, I think, out of suspicion, but simply to safeguard valuable merchandise. And when I woke in the morning, Anika had been sound asleep, sprawled on her bed with the covers kicked back and her night shift under her arms, an abandoned pose which did not suggest a fond farewell at the door and replacing the key under my pillow. And yet, three mornings running, I had woken with a mouth like the floor of a bird cage and a cleaver in my skull. Perhaps he can fly. I said to Dester. He snorted and nudged me impatiently. I returned to my task and determined on two things before I had finished. In the first place, Anika would have my wine tonight, and I hers, and in the second, I would watch all night with my sword drawn. Anika was delighted when I arrived with my sword balanced on top of my saddlebags. What are you going to do? she demanded. Will you practice? Has it a name? Her name is Fenala, I said rather shortly. I had forgotten, until I drew the blade, that it was not my own familiar one of blue southern steel. That lay on Fenala's breast in the tomb beside the village temple, away beyond Rondis. She needs to be oiled, I said. This was partly true. There isn't room to practice here. "'Show me!' said Anika, kneeling beside me in three petticoats and no shoes. "'There's writing. What does it say?' I turned the blade on my knee and spelled out the ancient letters with difficulty. "'Niachan Lendova,' I read at length. "'A friend has two edges.' "'A friend has two edges?' she repeated. "'What does it mean?' "'I don't know,' I said." It's a very old sword. You'd better dress. It's nearly dinner time. She leapt up with a squeal that started my headache again and seized another petticoat. I set down the sword and began to remove my travel-stained clothes. They had just brought warm water to wash with. Anika had used most of it, as usual. Can you read? she demanded through the final petticoat. Well, of course I can, I said, and write. They teach us in the order. Oh, of course, the order, she said. Mama says reading's unfeminine. You surprise me, I said rather dryly. She lifted her brown and gold dress and pulled it over her head. It matched her hair, which was braided down her back after the custom of Rondis. I thought for the manyth time what a pity it was she would go to Dervir. 
where the ladies went powdered and corseted in dresses ever richer than their neighbors. I expect my husband wouldn't like it if I could read, she said complacently, smoothing the dress down. I reached for my clean shirt. Don't you want to be married, Thula? Although I expect it's a bit late now, I mean, you're twenty-one. She made a sound as if I would soon be fifty. There was a girl left at thirty to get married, I said a little defensively. She made round eyes. My sister was younger than me when she was married, she said. Mama says a man should be twice your age when you marry. Did that girl marry a man of sixty? I doubt it, I said rather sharply, doing up my tunic. My husband's thirty-two, she said, brushing out her hair. Gellin says he's very handsome, but I think he should be a bit younger, say about twenty-seven. Something in her tone made me say, Do you want to marry him? In the mirror her lips moved, but the sound was drowned by a banging at the door. Ladies, shouted the cousin, are you ready? Nearly, squeaked Anika, braiding her hair with rapid expert fingers. Snatching a ribbon, she wound it quickly round the ends and knotted it, and I straightened my tunic, stuck my dagger in my belt where it belonged, and opened the door. We are ready, good sir, I said. He bowed, averting his eyes from my trousered legs, and offered his arm to Anika. Curtsying, she accepted its support. I followed them downstairs, wondering if I had been right. In the mirror, Anika's answer to my question had looked very much like no. After dinner, we played the game of siege. It is a board game where one player defends a corner of the board against the other, the number of the pieces depending on the skill of the players. It is more common in the East Lands than here in the West. They often use it as a ritual means of making temple offerings. I beat Anika, and after a long game, her cousin, as he cleared the pieces, he said quietly, You and Anika should have another game, mistress. I am sure she will win this one. Are you? I said. So am I, said Anika, overhearing. Come on, Thula, it's barely dark. Moonrise isn't for hours yet. You won our last match, so you lose a man, and it's my turn to defend. I set up the pieces reluctantly. I was tired, and the cousin seemed to be expecting me to give her the game. Against a player like Anika, this is not easy. She played badly, but she was astute enough to see when I made foolish moves deliberately, and, since the game is sacred to the moon... It was scarcely proper to reduce it to an amusement for a merchant's spoiled daughter in this way. I won. Anika was annoyed, and she showed it. We're playing another one, she said, and I'm going to win. It's bedtime, I said, and I've played three games in a row. Leave it till tomorrow night, Anika. No, she said, because tomorrow... She paused and changed what she was going to say. Tomorrow you'll be fresh again, and now you're tired. I'm sure I'll win. I was indeed tired, and my headache had returned. It was a long game, but at last Anika said, In three moves, Thula, I've got you. You have? I said, startled. She crowed with delight. Yes, I have. See, my captain moves there, and this soldier there and this one here, and you can't block any of them, and then I'm in the castle. Master Gellin crossed the room to see the board, and said, That's right, Anika. That's the falcon's mate. I taught it you, remember? So it is, she marveled. And you said only a clever player could use it properly. Now you have your revenge, I said. And I agree it was cleverly done. Are we going to bed? There was a jug of wine and two glasses set on the kist between the beds. To make things easy, I went to the window and leaned out. The courtyard was five fathoms down, and sheer. Only a fly could climb the wall. I turned, and Anika was sitting on her bed sipping wine. I went and sat down too, then said, Your hair is a funny color. I wonder if it's going gray. Gray? she said. No, it can't be. 
She set down her wine, some of it slopping over, and ran to the nearest box, delving in frantic haste for a mirror. I put my glass in the ring hers had made, and took hers in my hand. She got out the mirror and began peering anxiously, using the mirror over the washstand to see the back of her head. "'Perhaps it's just the light,' I said reassuringly. "'Or the dust. Your hair does look funny in candlelight sometimes.' "'Well, it looks all right now,' she said. "'You frighten me.' In ten minutes she was asleep, half undressed. I finished the task with difficulty and covered her up. Then I went to the window again, and on a sudden impulse took my naked sword and wedged it across the aperture, the sharper edge outward. Then I took my dagger in my hand, blew out the candle, and sat cross-legged on my bed to wait for dawn, or was I waiting for moonrise? And what would come then, anyway? I began to feel that perhaps I was acting foolishly. I comforted myself with the thought that if I was, no one would know, except perhaps Zanika, and went over the facts again. I had thought this was a good way to cross the old mountain safely and be paid for doing it. There are lone war maids, but I am not one of them, and Fanala was too recently dead for my own company to be a good thing. We had never been lovers, as I believe some pairs are, but we had been inseparable since I was eight and she nine, and the gap made by her death. I dragged myself sharply from that train of thought. It led, as well I knew, to endless fits of weeping, and this was no time for tears. I had wept enough to fill an ocean. Those weeks at the temple in Rondis while I waited for another pair to come in, or a lone girl like me who wanted company. Then Mother Superior had sent for me and described this task. Ennis ma dor ma Ennis required a chaperone bodyguard for his daughter. Ten gold pieces to me and ten to the order if she reached her husband as she left her father's house. It had seemed simple enough when I accepted. Through the window I could see stars. They moved slowly past my sword, and at length the moon rose and threw silver on the wall. I began to feel numb and tried to move and could not. Panic rose in my throat as I tried, unavailing, to move so much as an eyelid. For what seemed an eternal year I struggled, and then a voice spoke. Anika, it said, are you watching, little love? She will not wake. I have a keeping spell on her. Are you watching, Anika? I would have spoken, but I could not. Anika never moved. Wings swished, and a great dark shape floated across the patch of sky. Anika, said the voice. It's fenest. The moon has risen. Wake and let me in, love, for she has barred the window. Are you waking, Anika? Still I could not answer him, and Anika never moved. Again the wings swished and the dark shape was at the window. Talons scrabbled on the sill, square-tipped wings beat and fluttered. A small sound of pain came on the night air. Anika, he said desperately now, her sword at the window cuts me to the bone. Anika, this night of all nights, wake me and let me in, for I bleed here in the darkness. Anika! I truly think if I could have stirred, I would have risen and let him in. But he had bespelled me, and Anika never moved. There was a silence in which I heard breathing surely harsher than a bird's, and something splashed on the sill. Then he said, Anika, I called you three times, and you did not answer, and tonight I was to bear you away. If you will not come to me by your will, you shall come by mine. The dark wings, edged with moonlight, moved in the patch of sky, swished into the distance, and were gone. And I was left waiting, numb with grief as with his spell. The pleading in his voice had touched my heart. Just so I had pleaded with Fanala, to wake and to turn to me and to answer me, and she never moved. I pulled myself together. That was no solitary war maid, but a shapeshifter who had seduced an innocent maid destined for another man, instructed her to make me sleep, 
maybe even given her the stuff to put in my wine. And what had they been doing while I slept? I made an involuntary movement to reject that thought and discovered I could move again. Jumping up, I ran to the window and got my sword in. There was blood on the blade, still warm, and great drops of it gleaming faintly in the moonlight lying on the sill. I cleaned my sword and sheathed it and undressed slowly and lay down, but for a long time I could not sleep. Two voices rang in my head. One was Fenist's, the shapeshifter's. If you do not come to me by your will, you shall come by mine. The other was my own, reading the words on my sword. A friend has two edges, it said. How should a person have two edges? Should a sword be my only friend? Certainly, if one got involved with people, one got involved in problems. The thunder that woke me diminished, and became Master Gellin banging on the door. I answered something and he went away, and I got out of bed. Anika lay heavily asleep, as if she had not stirred all night. My eye lit on my sword, propped beside the bed, and the events of the night rushed into my mind. Mother of mares, I prayed, give me the strength to dissemble. I cannot lie, and you know it. I bent to shake Anika awake. There was no chance to dissemble. She roused slowly, but I saw the point at which she realized she had missed him. She leapt out of bed, despite the way it must have pained her head, and ran to the window and flung it wide. She stared out, east then west, at the mountains looming closer, and then her gaze fell on the dried blood on the sill. She froze for a moment. Then she began to scream. We were late leaving. Anika was still in hysterics, although by now these were mercifully reduced to a dry sobbing and occasional moans of traitor. I had not attempted to argue, but concentrated on getting her into the litter. The cousin's enquiries I had stopped with a significant glance at the moon just vanishing behind the mountains. It was plausible enough. He was scarcely likely to know when her last moon day had been. Since half the column of pack horses had already moved off, her boxes were heaved into the litter beside her, and she lay sobbing among them with the curtains closed. I felt for her, but I could see no other course than to take her to her husband, and hope she could be taught enough to fool him on his wedding night. We rode out of the inn-yard, and up the dusty road that led to the North Pass. The two big horses bearing the litter made good speed, and I, riding beside them on my gray dester, kept them up. The pack train reached the approaches to the pass before noon. The road rose up in coils about the gray, dusty heights, bare of grass and heather. We rode more slowly now, but by mid-afternoon we had crossed the first false summit, and as the road wound, we caught occasional glimpses of the high house where we would spend the night. The road itself was narrow, the column had long since shuffled into single file, and I was riding ahead of the litter. The last dozen or so pack-horses behind it, when Anika put her head out and informed me, with the icy adolescent dignity, that she wished to go behind a bush. "'There aren't any here,' I said. "'It'll have to be a rock.' I reined back and halted the litter, and the pack-horses picked their way past, the drivers grumbling as the horses slithered in the stony ground. Anika emerged from the litter and found a suitable rock. When she emerged from behind it, some time later, the tail of the column was well out of sight, and the head was already appearing round the curve beyond. As she climbed back into the litter, a shadow crossed the sun, and I could have sworn I heard the swish of wings. But when I looked up, the sky was clear and empty. I whipped up the two big horses, and they achieved a lumbering trot. We thudded up to the corner, and round it, into a cutting where the road widened to its original size. My dester shied, and tossed his head, unwilling to go on. "'What is it, stupid?' I asked him, urging him on with knees and heels, using the whip in both hands alternately on him and on the litter horses. 
He squealed and half reared, swinging around into the lead horse, and there was a rumbling and crashing of thunder above us, and suddenly the defile before us was full of rocks, great boulders, pebbles, earth, and a choking dust that rose above everything. The lead horse, already alarmed by Dester, screamed in panic and tried to back and run away both at once. The other horse backed too, and somehow, I don't know how, the next thing was the two litter horses bolting back down the road away from me, the litter jerking and swaying between them, Anika's shrill screams floating back over the drumming hooves. I finally got control of Dester and turned him after the litter, at a less breakneck pace. Nothing excites a runaway like being chased. Then a last mutter and rumble came above me, and another few boulders crashed down. I think a pebble or something got Dester on the quarters because he squealed again and leapt forward. I stayed on by some miracle, and found I was clinging to the pommel while we went down the road after the litter as if there were wings on his big feet. I still don't know where we went. After the litter, yes, but that left the road soon. I was too busy staying on and trying to get control to look at the scenery. When Dester tired, I finally got control and drove him on at the trot, although he wanted to stop and get his breath back. We were on a track, and up ahead was the litter, on a sort of knoll beyond an overhang. It was intact and securely fastened to both horses, who stood with heads down, sides heaving. Anika was still moaning inside it. I was concentrating on that, which is why the man who jumped me from the overhang took me quite by surprise. I marked him with teeth and nails, and I had nearly got the upper hand when his companion came running up and struck me over the head. Sparks flared, and I fell into night. I woke in the torchlight. It flickered and left beyond my closed eyelids, and above the crackle of the pine were small sounds, rustling and breathing. My head hurt. I wondered vaguely why, and then remembered. Anika, I said, opening my eyes. She appeared beside me, looking only relieved, though the tear stain still showed. Does it hurt, she said, your head? I put up my hand and felt gingerly, a lump where the neck muscles joined the skull, stabbed with pain when I touched it. No blood. I'll live, I said. Where are we? What happened? I don't know, she said. Thula, I'm frightened. Tell me what happened after I was laid out, I suggested, and sat up with caution. I was on a high, well-draped bed. About us were kists and a cupboard, and a curtain that swung in the draft and probably covered a guard robe. The window was shuttered. A high fireplace gaped blackly across the room. How did we get here? I prodded. She sat on the bed beside me. They threw you in on top of me, she said obediently. They wouldn't speak to me. I don't understand what they said to each other. I didn't see where we went. I was trying to wake you. Then they made me get out in the courtyard here, and two of them carried you, and one took my arm, and we came here, and I couldn't wake you, so I went to sleep, she finished. That made me giggle. It hurt, so I stopped abruptly. Anika gave me a dignified look and added, There's some food. With a glass of wine and a chicken wing, I felt better. I prowled around the room eating, relieved to find my legs would bear me. I could see no way out. I kept remembering the words of Anika's lover. If you do not come to me by your will, you shall come by mine. What could I do with Anika to take care of? I had to get her to her husband in Mer Kuith. But how should we escape from here? The door flung open. Anika drew breath as if to scream. I reached for my dagger, but the second man had a crossbow, wound and loaded and pointing at me. The first bowed to Anika and took her wrist. The second stood aside into the room. The third came in and took my arm, and he had a knife in his other hand. Anika said, Thula! It's all right, I said. I don't think they're going to hurt you. We were led down the wheel stair, the crossbow at the back of my neck. 
At the foot of the stair, a boy with a torch bobbed and stared at Anika, then turned and went off along a corridor into the deeps of the castle. We were led after, our escorts never letting go, the crossbower padding softly behind me on felt-soled boots. Through many corridors we went, and up more stairs till I began to think of rabbit warrens. Then we halted at a door. Anika's guide knocked and spoke harshly. The door was opened, and we stepped into a glare of torches and candles. Anika stood in front of me maybe three seconds, then she gave a great cry of, Fenist! Oh, Fenist! She ran forward, and I was prodded into the room. The door closed. In front of me, Anika knelt by a bed heaped with furs. The light of many candles fell on her head and on the hand that came from among the furs and lay on her neck like a caress. I walked around the bed, the crossbow following as I moved, until I could see her face. She was bent over the man in bed, kissing him quickly with light, practiced movements. He was whispering, the words half lost against her face, over and over, Anika, my dear love, my heart's delight, Anika. I watched with the half-dozen men in the room for some time. At length, I stepped forward, despite the insistent crossbow at my side, and put my hand on her shoulder. She looked round, startled, and the man's eyes rose to mine. I looked away from the challenge in them, and said gently, Anika, you're promised, remember? You are betrothed to Alevirma Juldin of Dervir. I made no promises, she said. I signed no contracts. Women are not chattels, Thula, to be bargained for like diamonds and cinnamon. You should know that. She is mine, said the man among the furs. I straightened, and this time met his hawk's eyes squarely. Good sir, I swore a covenant with her father that she would reach her husband's house as she left her father's, or not at all. I swore to defend her honor as my own. My honor is a small thing. His eyes mocked me, and I added hastily, Except to me, but the order loses twenty crescents and honor as well. I'll give you forty, he said. The eyes danced. Under his beaked nose, the cruel mouth suddenly smiled entrancingly. There is the matter that she hasn't reached me as she left her father's house. But I'll forget that in the circumstances. I should kill her, I said. At my feet, Anika shrank into the crook of her lover's arm. And how far would you go from here if you did? He was watching me with a certain amount of sympathy. Mistress, how would her life be in the women's quarters of Alever Ma Julden's house? I remembered dimly my mother's life before I was given to the order. Scents and rustling gowns, other ladies coming and going, and the echo of my father's voice making her freeze like a rabbit hearing a fox. The man was watching me. Just so, he said, reading my expression. Here she will be mistress of my castle and counselor of my people. I may even teach her to read. He kissed the end of her nose and turned back to stare at me like a hawk hovering for a long moment. Then the hawk swooped. I'm damned if I'll lie here, he said, moving stiffly among the firs, helping you argue down your conscience. Obik. Fetch me the board yonder, mistress. I'll play you three games of siege. If I win three, Annika decides your fate and hers. If I win two, you may go free and no more said. If you win two, you may try if you can persuade Annika to go with you. And if I win three, I said. He laughed and winced as if it hurt him. You won't he said confidently. But you will, love, said Anika. I beat her last night, and you can beat me. He kissed her again, and brought the other arm out of the furs to wave me to a seat across the board. White linen on the brown skin made Anika gasp. Oh, Fenist, I thought, 
She looked at his arm, then pulled back the furs. More linen was swathed about his belly where the ribs stopped. She stared for a moment, then tucked the furs around him again and raised her eyes to my face. "'You did that,' she said, and I knew suddenly that it would not be good to lose three games, and I had thought she liked me. "'In the line of duty,' said Fenest, "'I bear no grudges. I was foolish, perhaps.' He inspected the pieces laid out on the board. My move to start, mistress. So, King's captain, advance three paces. I looked up, startled, but he had turned back to Anika. That move opened the most famous of the ritual games and was rarely used otherwise. Perhaps I was imagining things? I replied with the following move, King's captain to the corner turret. He looked back at the click of the piece on the board and moved his queen's soldier two squares left without hesitating. Across the squared board his eyes met mine, unreadable. When I made pretense to consider before moving the queen's knight in support of my king's captain, he smiled gently and shifted carefully among the furs. I stared at the board, not seeing it. This was ritual play, and I was to win. Why? So I go free, I said, setting up the pieces for the second game. He smiled again and nodded. So you go free, mistress. Your move to start. I hesitated, hand over the board. If I won, I could try to persuade Anika to leave and honor her father's promise. If I lost, I might still win the next one. I lifted my queen, still hesitating. If she merely moved in in support of her king, set at the front of the siege from the beginning, that was an ambiguous start. But if she moved to the attack, so, I said, queen to the corner turret. His smile showed that he appreciated the move. Very symbolic, he said. So is my move, king to the corner turret. A cold finger stroked my backbone. This was free play and I was playing with either a master or a fool. Somehow, looking at the narrow, intent face, I could not think the Lord Fenist a fool. But they teach us well in the order, before they send us out into the world. I moved my king to support my queen. This game took longer. Anika and his soldiers watched in silence, unmoving. We did not stir, except to reach over the board, moving the ebony and ivory pieces. The only sound was the click of the men on the board and the hiss and crackle of the torches on the wall, and the slow breathing of my opponent. Mate, he said at last, in three moves, not so? Five, I said. Well, five, he conceded reluctantly. Obik, wine for the ladies. I stretched and realized my head was aching. He watched me, the cruel mouth smiling under his hawk's beak of a nose. Will you not admit me the third game? He said. Admit you are outplayed? I had been considering doing just that. No, I said. He laughed and winced. I drank wine and set up the pieces. You lose a man, I said. I defend, so you move first. He considered a moment, then he moved, King's soldier right three paces, another opening rarely used outside the rituals, and this time he was to win. I looked at the board, then at him. The next move to this game was Queen's soldier to the rampart, two paces. I considered for more than a moment, then I lifted my queen. Queen to the corner turret, I said clearly, and set her down. His hand had been hovering already over his queen's soldier to move it in support of the other piece. At my words, he looked back sharply from Anika's upturned face. One comprehensive glance, and he began laughing, his hand to his side. Oh, don't, love, said Anika anxiously. Fenist, please don't. You'll make it bleed. I know, he said, still laughing weakly. Oh, you show your teeth, mistress. Well, here is your answer. King to the corner turret. That game took longest of the three, 
Anika and the soldiers watched in silence. The only sounds were the click of the men on the ebony and ivory board, and the hiss and crackle of the torches, and the slow breathing of my opponent. It took the longest, and it was won by the least margin. Mate, he said at length, in three moves, with these three men, King's captain moves there, his soldier here, and this one here, and I hold the castle. I can see, I said, no need to spell it out. Falcon's mate. No, he said, no need. He lay back among the firs, gray-faced. I stood up, saying, Good sir, when do I go free? In the morning, he said. I'll give you food and a spare horse. His speech was slurred. Anika, bending hastily over him, was the only one who caught his next words before he did slip into sleep. She straightened. Across the bed piled with furs, her eyes met mine, unloving. You lose hard, she repeated. She looked round at the men. Go house her as my lord would wish, she said. The place we were in will do. I turned at the door, despite the crossbow once more insistent at my shoulder. Anika, I said. She was still watching me. What does it say on my sword? She stared at me, remembering slowly. A friend has two edges, she said at last. There was another silence. Then she crossed the room. The bower stood aside for her, and she leaned up and kissed my cheek, and then turned back to her sleeping lord. Good night, Anika, I said. Goodbye, my friend, she said. It's nearly dawn. So I rode alone, down from the old mountains into Amun, on the road southwest, with forty gold crescents close-packed in one saddlebag as Anika's bride price, and ten in the other as my wages, since it would be unwise to try to collect from Aliver Ma Julden, and my conscience was unquiet, for the game of siege, sacred to the moon, should not be used as I had used it. The difference is subtle between one losing and another winning, and whatever he might think, Lord Fenist, Fenist the Falcon, had not won the last game. I had lost it. There are many more games written down than ever are used in the rituals. The End I tend to be somewhat sparse about autobiographical details, but I will tell you with a uh, humbleness and pride mixed together that I was the worst kid in chess club when I was in middle school. So I've got some appreciation for memorized games. I, th I thought I was all right at chess until I played with some mathematician friends in college and they, they had games memorized at a level even my chess club brain couldn't handle. They played speed chess with the clock going and memorized every possible variation. I suspect Thula may have done similar memorization. I like all of the double meanings in this story. Falcon's mate is like a checkmate in the game of chess, but Falcon's mate is also Anika, who is the mate of the shapeshifter and the theme of the, the double-edged friend cuts both ways. Anika would have condemned Thula to death, and certainly had been drugging her and undermining her, but at the same time seemed genuinely to care for her. Meanwhile, Thula cared for Anika, but was willing to take the bribe and let her go. With, with some ambivalence, there's also... I think a gender commentary about the roles of women, which is interesting. What does independence mean? What does liberation mean? And do we really think Anika will live a much better life with the cruel-mouthed Fenist? Perhaps. There are more tales of Thula, precisely four more, and I expect, over the course of the coming year, that we will see them here on the channel. Anyways, thanks for listening, and don't forget to check out 
thrilling suspense, fantasy, my magazine of classic pulp, and comics, made by me, made in the contemporary era, with all of the panache, verve, vivacity, and uh, zazzle of the classic era. There are in the uh, links in the description box below. With that said, I'm going to say goodbye, Happy New Year, and see you in 2023.